Hello and good evening, everyone. My name is Samantha Lay, and I am the president and CEO of the Seattle Southside Chamber of Commerce. And we are. <laughs> We are so excited that you're all here with us tonight. And on behalf of our staff, our board, our ambassadors, we want to officially welcome you to the 2024 Mayor's Reception and State of the Region. And I am so honored to invite Gina Medea, Vice President for Government Affairs of, of Seattle King County Realtors to join me on stage to share a few words. Good evening, everybody. I'm Gina Medea. I'm with Winnemar Real Estate. And as the Vice President of Seattle King County Realtors um, Governmental Affairs, on behalf of our 6,500 members here in King County, we want to thank each of you, and especially our city leaders, for participating in this event. Our realtors appreciate the opportunity to be the presenting sponsor this evening. You know, as realtors, we don't just sell houses. What we sell is quality of life in our communities. We believe that quality of life begins with a good job in a company that has a great future and that a home is where that job goes at night. For that reason, we feel a deep kinship with the members of our Chambers of Commerce who create and provide jobs and elected officials who share our values regarding the importance of housing for all. It's just one of the reasons that we're so pleased to be a sponsor this evening and to work closely with the local elected officials and chambers, including Seattle South Side, its members, and the five cities that they serve. It's also the reason that we've been strong supporters of the South Sound Chamber's legislative coalition since its inception. So we want to take a moment to thank Sammy, Samantha Lee, for her, out <laughs> for her outsized role and exceptional work in supporting the interests of the chamber members, the five cities, and the coalition. And also to congratulate Sammy on her well-deserved promotion to chief executive officer. It's a great fit and it has success written all over it. So I want to mention two substantive issues briefly. First, the 2023 legislative session um, dubbed the housing session, resulted in several heavy lifts for local governments, including planning for and accommodating middle housing and accessory dwelling units. Now those responsibilities are in, in addition to the earlier House Bill 1220, the step housing mandate, which have been made more difficult for the city because of delays in receiving promised assistance from the Department of Commerce. There will be an enormous amount of work for cities to complete over the next 20 years. I know this personally, I am a planning commissioner, <laughs> as you are too, Ms. Pam. Um, but especially before the state's deadline of the end of this year and the subsequent one that we're facing in June of 2025. But as realtors, we stand ready and able to help both the cities and the chambers with those efforts. Well, you may or may not know that our staff at Seattle King County Realtors endeavors to review every single agenda for every one of your city council meetings, council subcommittee meetings, and planning commission meetings. And they report back to us every 60 days. So we understand in some detail your work with these heavy lifts. And we want you to know that we have seen some amazing efforts. Your work has not gone unnoticed or unappreciated. So thank you for those efforts because they are key to addressing the housing crisis. The housing crisis is not only the biggest crisis facing our communities, it also poses the greatest risk to that quality of life that all our residents, whom the realtors, chamber members, and elected officials have the privilege to serve. Second, I want to mention rent control. There's an understandable and natural empathy for households that are being squeezed by not having enough housing units for all people who want and deserve a place to live. And by the rents, which have outpaced incomes, especially for workers in the service industries. There will be a strong push at the legislature for rent control. If approved, there will be a relatively small number of renters who will benefit from it, 
for a relatively short period of time. But the research-based evidence is clear. Over time, these measures make things worse, not better, for renters. One of the way it does so is by driving mom and pop landlords out of the rental business, especially when those policies push them to sell their single family homes or condos. Because when that happens, the supply of rentals available in the marketplace is less than it otherwise would be, making things even more difficult for renters, and especially for those most economically vulnerable residents in our communities. Candidly, there is really only one form of rent control that works. It's called the 30-year mortgage, and we can help with that. <laughs> so as you face calls for rent control, we ask that you take a bigger picture or a longer-term view of the situation and focus instead on voluntary incentives rather than mandates and make outsized efforts to increase the supply of housing at all income levels. The Housing Trust Fund, which provides state subsidies, was the brainchild of Realtors, who provided the initial funding using interest earns on the trust accounts from earnest money deposits. We also supported the recent legislation that created the new Covenant Housing Program to assist the, historic, the historically disadvantaged. And I hope you're as pleased as I am with the latest numbers that I just received. The total allocation, $7.1 million. The total number of loans closed thus far, 39, including 24 in King County, with 29 additional loans reserved or in process. Today, cities are also allocating their own funding for subsidized units. We encourage you to focus those revenues on subsidies for households at or below 30% or 50% of the area median income, where the work is the most difficult, but the return on that investment the most rewarding. Expansion of the multifamily tax credit for both new construction as well as existing units also makes a lot of sense. Increasing the supply of housing in a way that would allow would-be buyers to become homeowners and move out of the rental market frees up additional rental units, which can reduce some of the demand and price pressure in that rental space. So from these two examples alone, we can see the complex and intrinsic relationship between the various elements of a multi-pronged effort to address our housing crisis. This is not easy work, and again, we appreciate um, the city officials that are doing their best to, to move this forward. So in closing, and on that note, um, as just one example of many of the good things happening, we would like to offer a quick thumbs up to the city of Burien for its recent work <laughs> to broaden the income threshold to qualify for home ownership assistance incentives from 50% of AMI to 80% of AMI. Well done, and thank you. So thank you again, everybody, for coming. We look forward to the program, as well as the opportunity to continue to collaborate with you. Thank you very much. And thank you, Gina. Um, it's now my great pleasure to introduce Josh Gerstman, Vice President and Executive Director of Highline College and the Highline College Foundation, to join me to share a few words. Good evening, everybody. I remember being in this room a few years ago. I can't remember, Sammy, if it was this exact room, but it feels like this room watching from down there and saying Highline College should be a bigger part of this program because this is a program that brings and ties our community together. And as it says, stronger together, that is a theme that works with everybody in this room. Max has got a presentation going up there. He's just gonna randomly flip through some slides and I'll re reference them, but before he does, I do wanna say welcome to Highline. This is our community. We are your community's college. We've been here since 1961. We're led by Dr. John Mosby, who is currently on medical leave, but if he was here, you'll see him in a moment saying good afternoon. When you see him on that screen, I'm gonna have my phone out. I'm just giving you a cue. I wanna record that so I can send uh, a good afternoon back to Dr. John Mosby and wish him speedy recovery. I am here with some colleagues from Highline College, I, and I'm curious, how many of you have ever taken classes at our campus? There's a, look at that. That's amazing, give yourselves a hand. 
So it may have been a few days or a few years, but I wanted to make sure you knew that as a South King County College striving for social justice, Highland College partners with global students as they envision, plan, and achieve their educational and professional goals. That's the mission that we established in 2022. And Max, you can just start flipping through there. Um, there he is, so now you saw it. I'm, just give me a second, I, I tried to prepare you for it, but can you all say good afternoon to Dr. John Mosby? All right, that was excellent, and I even recorded it. I hit the button, and you can go on and just start flipping through there. We are the one college with many paths, and those many paths don't, it's not just about where people are going, it's where they're coming from. We're here to meet students where they're at. More than a third of our students are in our LCAP program, uh, English Language Career and Academic Prep. They're here as immigrants and refugees, as you all know, in the communities that you serve. And we are here to say, where do you want to go? And we're going to meet them at the level that they're at, and we're going to work in, and support them to where they're going to go. We hope that that's at Highland College, but if that means going up uh, to Tequila to an apprenticeship program with a new, or going in one of the apprenticeship programs that the unions have, or going to South Seattle to learn how to become an airframe and power plant uh, mechanic, we're gonna support them in that, because we know that that's what our community needs. But you're gonna see all the great things that we have at Highline. Let's keep rolling there, Max. We're in a beautiful hotel here in SeaTac, Washington. The folks who run these great institutions need to be trained somewhere. We do that training at Highline College through our host program. Not only do those folks come and manage and lead the, the, um, the institutions like this, but they're active in our communities. I see Tony Hetler down here. Our host students are super active as volunteers in Des Moines. They can be active in Burien and SeaTac. Just contact us and we'll get them engaged and involved. Um, when we do our commencement down there at Showwear, we tried to keep commencement on our campus, but guess what? We outgrew our campus for commencement. When we have 700 students who are walking in a graduation ceremony and they all want to bring several generations of family members to join them for that, we need to be in a space as big as Showwear. And who knows, maybe in a few years we'll be up there at um, Lumen Field or, to, you know, we'll keep going. Um, we have amazing alumni. There are some great alumni that are featured there. Uh, they're community uh, leaders, they're activists, they're business leaders, they're engaged and involved. Um, she may not be on that list yet, but I'm sitting right next to Eileen Lambert, who's a class of 99, and all of you who raise your hands, you're all part of that distinguished alumni program at Highline College. We do great programming and engage the community. We have the Black and Brown Male Summit coming up in here in November. It'll be our 14th year, gathering approximately 400 young men of color so that they can gather and they can decide who they want to be. The biggest message they learned that day is that the community and society doesn't get to dictate who they are. They control that narrative. And one of the places they learn that is by coming to our campus and engaging with role models and powerful speakers and supporting with each other. And then we do that again in the spring with a group of women through the Yale Summit. And there you go. So, if, and not to be forgotten in our, in our community, Sammy mentioned um, our, the acknowledging of the land. Those are beautiful words. But at Highland College, we believe we have to find ways to bring those words to life. We do that through a Native Student Success Summit. We do it through honoring of um, uh, Indigenous Peoples Day in a couple weeks. And we'll just find ways to be able to engage with our community and have that learning happening. And people who can write much better than I can speak, poetry at Highline is a thing of beauty. Uh, we have a poetry month in April, come on up. Uh, and Peter Smith is out in the audience. We've been talking about how to get our poets and our artists off campus and into the community. We'd love to be at the Des Moines Theater. We'd love to be in spots like this. We'd love to be at the Highland Heritage Museum. Those are the ways that we can work with you to engage in the community. We honor our veterans. We'll be doing that here um, over Veterans Week, but throughout the year, we have a Veterans Resource Center, and thanks to uh, represent, uh, King County Council Member Dave Updegrove and the King County Council, we were able to open a new Veterans Resource Center on campus last spring, and uh, any veterans in the audience, come on to campus and connect with our veterans at, at Highland. And of course, you're gonna see us up and down the corridor here. 
and we'll just keep going, Max, just keep pushing me along. We believe in supporting our students. We talk about the basic needs uh, uh, from housing to food security. We're gonna do that. We've got them covered. We know once you sign up as a student at Highline that we're gonna work with you every step of the way. And there's some of our college leaders connecting internationally. You know, we have approximately 300 students who come from other countries specifically to study here. We also send students uh, abroad. Uh, two weeks ago, we had a group of 16 students go spend 10 days in Vietnam on a short-term study abroad program with the Center of Excellence for Global Trade and Supply Chain Management, the longest title ever. But the trip is an amazing trip. It's a chance for them to understand how Washington products uh, start here and go to Vietnam and how things from Vietnam start there and come here and we're going to build those relationships and build your communities. And we have scholarship programs, and we're just going to keep rolling along because I want to respect your time. We have housing. That building sits right across from the Kent Des Moines station, or Highline station as it's, you know, as we like to call it. And, and um, but those goats come every season to clean up, help us clean up the, the overgrownness on campus. Come on out in, in the future and join us. But you don't have to wait till June uh, to come see the goats. If you want to experience something great, come join us on November 2nd when it's our second annual Thunderbird Soar event. We're going to be soaring through the decades. Feel free to talk to my colleagues or I later on tonight on how you can get involved, uh, have a beautiful meal on campus, and celebrate Highland College. So thank you so much. Sammy, so glad to be here with you tonight. And it is now my pleasure to introduce our first mayor to come join me on stage, the mayor of Burien, a leader dedicated to fostering a vibrant and inclusive community. Please join me in welcoming Mayor Kevin Schilling, who will share insights into the exciting developments in the future of Burien. It is fantastic to be here tonight in a room full of people who are entrepreneurs, who are risk takers, who are investors, who are innovators, who are people who care about your community. It is phenomenal to see you all here celebrating what I guess we could kind of call Highline, the Highline community. Um, I know, there you go. My mom and my dad both got their AAs at Highline Community College, so go, go Highline. Uh, I first want to acknowledge this, this chamber and the incredible work that it does as a convener and a collaborator, and also really importantly, the fact that this chamber has had three generations of phenomenal leadership, Andrea Ray, Annie McGrath, and now Sammy. Can we give it up for the leadership ladder of Seattle Southside? I was, I was at the uh, AWB Policy Summit in my day job with Sammy, and she was the best dressed chamber exec <laughs> for the whole summit, um, which is great. I also want to say that this is, this is a fantastic event that I rarely get to see the other mayors and a lot of electeds from other cities, so it's been so great to just see all of you for, for tonight and exchange ideas and talk about how we're all doing. And, uh, and where we're at and how, and how we're gonna move forward together. Um, this is an exciting time for Burien. Uh, I wanna thank the work of the realtors and, and your shout out of, the, of what we're doing with housing and also for our partnership with Crown Castle and what we're doing innovatively in the city with these public-private partnerships. We wanna build housing, we wanna grow business, we want to connect people to services that are more efficient and less costly, shouldn't that be the goal of everyone in here tonight, but also every government agency working with the private sector? I think it should be. But excitingly too, I wanna, I guess, sort of break some news, even though the news has been broken. The, the big news of Burien today is that the US District Court has dismissed the county's lawsuit against the city of Burien and has said that the county sheriff's office, in collaboration and in partnership with us, through our paid contract, needs to start enforcing the laws we have on the books around public camping. And that's an important step, because from day one for the city of Burien, we have led with the belief that we want to get people off the streets and into shelter and services. 
And that, I think, is a shared goal of the business community, but every government in King County, we have a goal and a mission to connect people to the public services that our tax dollars fund. And I think it is vital to keep doing that to reduce the number of outside tent, tent sleeping and drug overdoses. It is the only way to save lives to get people off the street and into shelter and services. And I'm so happy to say that the US District Court has said King County's lawsuit against Burien is frivolous and that we need to get moving on enforcing it now. Overall, what I think I'm gonna talk about tonight and what all the other mayors are gonna talk about tonight is an overarching idea of trust between your city governments and your city elected officials and the public that we serve. So I guess we can go to the next, next slide there. The city of Burien, we have about 53,000 people, uh, 11 square miles. Importantly and interestingly about our city, one in three families speak a language other than English. We are a diverse community. We are majority minority not just in the community, but on the city council and on, uh, in our city government staff. We have made it a priority to ensure that the people working at the city reflect what the community looks like, sounds like, and, and it just reflects our community altogether. That's a huge win for the city of Burien, leading with the goal of making sure people are reflected in their city government. The majority of our city council is Hispanic. The majority of our city council is female. And we have worked hard, five minute warning, let's go. <laughs> All right, so we have, so we've been working on our comprehensive plan and we've been working on our economic development action plan. Our comprehensive plan focuses primarily on two things and we're hell bent on this. Building more housing of all kinds and growing our economy. We have to do both. It is a symbiotic relationship between the private sector and the public sector. If we wanna grow and improve public services, we need better ways to raise revenue. And the only way cities have to do that is property taxes and sales taxes. We need people to buy stuff and we need people to live there. So we've been working on our comprehensive plan and our economic development plan. Our comp plan, importantly, something I wanna highlight here, as a city, we have worked and are working and will expand our multifamily tax exemption credit, credit to the largest percentage of the city of Burien, but also the largest percentage right now proposed of any city in the state of Washington. Our economic development plan focuses on bringing more commercial development and small business assistance. As you've been to Burien, you know we are a small business community. We are a mom, pa, locally owned community that prides itself on multi-generational businesses, that prides itself on getting folks owned, operating, and living in the city of Burien. We can go to the next slide. Our investments, we've been working on a lot of investments, actually, workforce development. There's some groups in here today that received ARPA funds from us. Thank you for your partnership. We're continuing that. We're working on ch child care startups and expanding child care all over the city. This has been a multi-year effort to expand child care because we know child care is expensive. We need more supply of child care. Working on getting a new airport shuttle program up and running because if you've got a layover or you're gonna stop in, come to Burien and have some delicious food. Storefront repair grant program to ensure that if you have an issue with your storefront, you can get that repaired from a grant. Also, we have had the largest investment of human services money in the history of Burien. $2.9 million in human services investment that go across the community for housing support, homelessness support, drug addiction support, gang prevention support. $2.9 million, it's the biggest investment we've ever done. Uh, next slide, please. Rapid Ride just finished their expansion into Burien. So you can hop on the Rapid Ride at the Burien Transit Center and go into downtown Seattle. As many of us are aware in this room, we have Wash Dots State Route 509 expansion, and that's an interesting topic. We've had many conversations about it at the city, city council. We'll see what happens there. We're proposed to have the state do two roundabouts 
in one of our major corridors. I can't wait to see a bunch of emails of m members of the community mad about that. Um, and can't wait to tell them to talk to the state. Um, but, we, but we're going to see an expansion of, frankly, we're going to see an expansion of traffic through the city. And we're going to see an, ex an extension of semi-trucks, movement of goods. That's all well. That's all fine. But this is going to be an interesting new future of connectivity for the city of Berrien. Next slide, please. With our public safety, you just heard about the news with the, with the uh, uh, court case being dismissed. But we've had a successful co-responder model uh, where we partner a mental health provider with a police officer to go out into the community to address uh, mental health and substance abuse concerns. This is a model that we, that we piloted a couple years ago. We got federal funding for it. We got state funding for it. It's been great. And we're making sure that we can continue to push that. We know that's been effective. We know that has been something that has saved lives. We have also opened up dozens of supportive housing units as well as affordable housing units. We have partnered with Habitat for Humanity, DESC, Eco Thrive, as well as market rate housing to get housing built. I'm not interested in standing up here and saying, let's build housing. We are actually building housing in the city of Burien by putting the levers in place to make it so that builders can build and get more units online. That's all it takes. Let's stop talking about it and start making the tough decisions to change our zoning codes and change our building codes to make it happen faster. We, are, we pride ourselves on being a welcoming and inclusive community by advancing racial equity. You heard what I said we do at the city government. You heard what I said our city council looks like. But we also do that with the business community. And we have a group of people at the, at the city who go out and they connect with people who want to start businesses, who need help, that, that, that work to grow the, the economy of Burien and show that we are a supportive community for a diverse range of business needs. We'll skip, we'll skip one more real quick. So that also talks on our creative district. We have a, a new creative district and we have new plans in place for our corridors. There's so much more I could talk about. I can't believe it's only been 10 minutes. Thank you all very much. If you have any questions, please let me know. Send me an email, give me a call. Thank you, Mayor Schilling. That was awesome. And if you haven't gone out on a Friday night in Burien for great food and some culture, do it this week, please. And. If you haven't signed up for the Highline Schools Foundation Brat Trot, which is a week from Saturday, you can do that. But I know who's already going to win that. That's Mayor Tracy Buxton in Des Moines, because she is on the run faster than anybody I've ever met. So it is my pleasure to introduce my good friend, uh, Tracy Buxton, Mayor of Des Moines. Uh, she may not be the only mayor in America to raise chickens in her backyard, but she's the first one that I know who's doing it, and all within city code. And I'm sure she's going to talk about that and much more. So give Tracy a big welcome, Mayor Buxton. Oh, Josh, it's always good for a smile or a laugh. I appreciate working with him whenever I can. So I um, just appreciate you all being here tonight. So uh, I hope that throughout these presentations that you get, you feel like, oh, I want to go do that. Oh, I want to go see that in one of these cities. Hope that you all get a chance to experience something lovely in, in each of our cities. So it's a pleasure for me to be part of such a lovely community as Des Moines. As we continue to grow into a dynamic destination community, we're building arts, recreation, education, and commerce, and ensuring a safe place to live, work, and play, and bringing value to the entire region while we do it. Next slide. A new chapter is unfolding for the city of Des Moines. The city, known for its vibrant parks and views, its close-knit, protective community, and its steadfast city team, we have recently selected a new city manager. Her name is Katherine Caffrey. We're very excited to have her. With a reputation for visionary leadership and an impressive track record in municipal management, Katherine is ready to steer the city toward new heights. Next slide. Our leadership team <clears throat> has also added a new police chief, Ted Bowe. His vision is to make Des Moines a safe place to live, work, and play through fighting crime, building trust, and supporting our people. He brings with him 24 years of police experience in almost every area of law enforcement. He's hometown raised in South King County, served six years of, as a chief in Burien. 
He, uh, his background, he's got an undergrad in business administration at the UW and holds a naval postgrad degree in Homeland Security and is also a graduate of the FBI National Academy. He's developed and supported many community educational and support programs, most of them directed toward, toward our youth. Really glad to have him aboard. Next, <clears throat> with a fresh new leadership in place, we're excited for econ our economic plans to thrive. And one of the most momentous is our Des Moines Creek West Business Park. Over the last 15 years, the city has been implementing a vision for the Des Moines Creek Business Park to bring new economic activity, jobs, and environmental rec reclamation to the long vacant parcels that, were owned, that are still owned by the Port of Seattle. This work <clears throat> has included comprehensive plan amendments, zoning code updates, and development agreements, as well as extensive transportation and infrastructure improvements to accommodate the needs of various commercial and industrial businesses that were targeted for a future business park. Go this way. The latest section, the Des Moines Creek West phase, adds to this effort, and when completed, it will include the ability to support an estimated 600 plus jobs, sustainable design elements that will protect and actually enhance local wetlands, improve the regional trail system, and replace impacted trees by a minimum of three to one ratio. Panatoni Development Company is responsible for developing the majority of this existing business park is also the devel is developing this site. Next. Well, with a growing urban core, we're also creating opportunities for art, culture, dining, and walkability. But how do we connect this, a little nice little drone shot, to, next slide, to this? Well, we create dynamic synergy that invites recreation and opportunities for gathering. How do we create a true destination? And we feel like, in a sense, that's our, our gift to bring to the table is is becoming a destination for the region. Come down and enjoy the waterfront, right? So how do we connect those two? Through placemaking. Next slide. Capitalizing on our greatest assets and creating gathering sp spaces for the arts and recreation and retail. And our most exciting place to come, next slide, is our marina steps. So this project is going out to bid at the end of this year and it will be completed by Christmas next year. So exciting. Acknowledging the need for pedestrian connectivity between the downtown and the marina, the Des Moines Marina Steps Project, as part of a holistic marina development, will focus on enhancing the pedestrian experience for residents and visitors, creating a distinctive connection between Des Moines downtown and the waterfront. So it will have traditional steps, but also a meandering ADA compliant pathway, an innovative play place ending in a splash pad. This community space is highly anticipated, but there's more. Connecting with our downtown core will be Waterland Way, Green Street. So at the top of this, it will go to, next slide, a Green Street that connects the top of our steps to our downtown core. This project seeks to celebrate stormwater and improve water quality through visible landscape expression through a series of bioretention cells, the, le the steps, will then clean stormwater before it arrives in the Puget Sound. And additionally, the landscaping will draw inspiration and reference to iconic Pacific Northwest beachscapes, hillsides, and forests. Natural materials and native plants will be incorporated into the design to create a new city landscape that pays homage to its location. Next slide. So this, this whole element right there, and plus there's a couple of uh, additional parks there, the idea is to create a vital pedestrian connection and public view corridor from the downtown to the marina floor through a park-like setting that embraces the Pacific Northwest culture and environment and a central, so that central strain will connect on 223rd Street flanked by accessible walkways, places to pause and enjoy the view a central plaza for seasonal events and everyday use. The steps set the stage for future economic development through the physical connection with the marina, creating quality public open spaces, celebrating the movement of water. And I'm just going to say, to shade of the staff here, they wrote this. And isn't it poetic? <laughs> but I want to 
honor them, right? They, were, they, they knew I was going to do this, and they wrote these beautiful things for me. So I'm just saying what they wrote, right? And very, so, okay, so I just want to say that one thing again. What was it? Um, celebrating the movement of water and people to <laughs> form a new energized heart in the Marina District, a destination waterfront for the region, right? That's our goal. I mean, to bring people together. Um, and of course, all these places need celebrations and festivals. So, next slide. Over the last handful of years, energetic citizens partnering with the city have grown our community celebrations to one or two per month. From our burning boat, polar plunge, Easter, and the 4th of July to, next slide, Waterland. Uh, Waterland Festival, the Farmer's Market, Oktoberfest, Park Run, touch a truck and many holiday celebrations. In, and next slide. In closing, I hope that you will agree with me that Des Moines is an amazing place to live, work, and play for our residents, but also the entire region. That's our goal, to invite you all to come and live and work and play with us. So please come and enjoy us. Good night. Thank you, Mayor Buxton. Now it's my privilege to introduce our next speaker, Deputy Mayor Sue Ann Hoheimer from the city of Normandy Park. As I mentioned earlier, it's known for its beautiful parks and trails and commitment to preserving natural spaces. But did you guys know they have a bustling uh, like downtown kind of-ish uh, town center uh, with thriving businesses and it's so much fun. <laughs> um, and it, it has it hosts just amazing businesses down there and business owners and so it's wonderful so please join me in welcoming Deputy Mayor Sue Ann Hoheimer you know I don't always think that we would use the word bustling we would love to but it, as I sit at this table and listen to the other mayors um, Mayor Schilling leaned over to me when Mayor Buxton was talking about her great waterland area. I was like, oh, I'm so jealous. And I thought, yeah, me too. Like, I'm just, you know, the, the thing is, if every single place looked like every other place, then none of us would ever need to go anywhere. Right? And so the thing that's so cool about all of this is we all represent something really unique and distinctive in each of these five cities. And I just am so grateful for the Chamber for the many, many ways that they bring us all together and that they recognize us as a unit. And um, another organization recently, uh, the Soundside Alliance, and through their economic development program, they were able to kind of put together um, a little team of us um, that sort of offered um, a similar experience, like reaching out across the nation to those that might be considering moving their whole entire business to the Northwest to say, consider the South End. And they really did use kind of the work, live, play tagline. And I was really proud that our little Normandy Park City, which by far is the small little <laughs> small little kid of this group. Um, although I shouldn't say kid, we're also one of the old, we've been established since 1953. So sometimes I, I describe us as like the grandpa of the group. <laughs> and we do have a little bit of like a get off of my lawn kind of mentality sometimes, a little cranky, but um, you know, we've turned some really big corners recently, and I'm really proud of that too. So my original thought, what I was gonna share here, is in that model of work, live, play. Normandy Park is really, really most proud of being that live spot. We have an incredible bedroom community, um, and located, you know, where we've got this 2.5 square miles, it's about six miles, I think, of shore along uh, Puget Sound to the one side, and then we're, um, we've got First Avenue along the other, but we only own half the street. We only own the Normandy Park half, and the other half of the street is owned by either Burien or Des Moines. Um, and so when Sammy refers to us as having like a center, we're like, we don't have a center. <laughs> we, have, we have places that we call center, but they're actually, we have got Manhattan, Center and um, our um, town center. So we like to use the word center, but we're just being creative there because it's actually not technically in the center um, other than being a real hub of where people meet and greet and, um, and meet up in terms of community. Um, so, but back to that whole like cranky thing, I really do feel like Normandy Park has turned a big corner in, in you know, for years we did sort of have that um, attitude of like, oh, why can't we get that here? You know, we, we're up to 10 restaurants right now, which is huge for us. <laughs> Come and enjoy 
away any of our 10 locally owned restaurants. We also have some lovely little franchise restaurants in there. But um, I mean, 10 was a big number for us. The 10th is just about in the door. They haven't actually had their grand opening. Um, and we're all just, we can hardly wait to jump out and get, you know, number 10, welcome them in. Um, and I think it's like a wine bar, which will go over really well, I'm sure. Um, but that whole attitude that has been, you know, like, why can't we have that? Why can't we do that here in Normandy Park? And what I'm really proud to say that I feel we've relaxed into in these past few really recent years is, is we are what we are. We've come to like really understand, we love ourselves just how we are. We're just, we're a bedroom community that relies almost entirely on property taxes. We have just the tiniest little drop in the bucket for sales tax. So we're a little bit of an expensive place to live, but we've got everything from apartments to lovely homes right on the waterfront, everything in between. Uh, we're gonna be reaching out to Gina, I'm sure, for more help on uh, ADUs and how we can do more more of that. But really what we've realized is that who we are as Normandy Park is very intricately and beautifully woven together to Des Moines and Burien and Tequila and SeaTac. And we've decided, you know, I think we've really said when people say, where do you want to go for dinner? We're like, oh, should we do Des Moines? Should we do Burien? Where, you know, because we rely on so many of these other places in order to really fuel uh, our desire for entertainment and products and out and about. And I think it's been really beneficial to see us as um, as this one unit. We do have, um, I was gonna run through like a 12 to one number. Year, years ago we were, I was inspired by the Burien map. Can you believe, who's inspired by a Burien map? But, okay, good. <laughs> But I looked at your map and I thought, wait, what are all those sections? Like who determined those sections? Why when you see the Burien map, is it divided in those ways? And I, I kind of felt like I don't really know what all those dividing lines are. I come to find out that's a King County precinct map. And so I said, well, hey, pull that up for Normandy Park. Let's see ours. So it turns out in Normandy Park, we've got these 12 beautiful little sections already determined by King County precinct map. And so we have worked really hard this year to kind of weave together a very um, grassroots kind of uh, community block watch, if you will. We're using kind of the Normandy Park block or the, the nationwide block watch program. And we've got, province coordinators who are kind of overseeing their whole area and they're working with individuals who want to be block watch captains and what's been really great is to sort of see our all the different socioeconomic strata coming together within each little community to really rebuild community bonds that in some cases maybe they weren't even there in the beginning and it's we're building them in other cases they were built and sort of through covid and so much uh, migration we um we've actually we've had a lot of people move on and move in and a lot of that what felt like our real community bonds were not feeling as strong and so we're really looking forward to seeing that be strengthened through some of this new um, sort of framework that we've been able to put into place um, I took our um, some of my notes from the last time we did this, our, our mayor has been under the weather and asked if I would fill in tonight. Um, and so in just looking at the numbers from a few years ago when I gave this address, it was really kind of fun to see how things are shifting and changing. And one thing I thought you might appreciate hearing is that um, you know people say like, well, you're not getting any younger. <laughs> and But it turns out that Normandy Park actually is getting younger. I was like, wait, how is that working? But our median age has come down a lot. In just the last two years, we were a uh, median age of 50.6, and we're already at 45. But I think what is happening there is we do have a lot of our older residents that have moved on and moving in. There's like double income, young folks, and you know they're bringing that number down uh, quickly. And um, so that's really bringing our activity level up. And um, you know we're just looking forward to really doing a a lot with our parks and our trails and um, so between community spirit and parks and trails and outdoor activities Normandy Park is an incredible place to live 
And so um, we definitely are grateful for our partners in these other cities. We're thankful that we've got lots going on there. Um, but for people who are business owners in Normandy Park, I know they would tell you that they're really grateful for the loyalty. We love our businesses. So if you're a small business and you're looking for a new place to plant yourself, we will treat you really well in Normandy Park. I don't think we lost any businesses during COVID. Like we worked hard in every single way to really support our people. Um, um, and of course, if you know anybody else out and about who's thinking of like moving in the company, they got to look at Normandy Park for a place to live. Um, and they really, so much of that is thanks to all of you. Thanks to our group. Our, we have our, um, our publisher in the house, but we have our City Scene magazine. It's produced quarterly. Um, we're coming up on our 50th edition. But things like that are just a great way to keep us all woven together as a community. And um, it's a great place for people to advertise. Let us know about your businesses because, again, Normandy Parkers are kind of here to support all the rest of you as well and really continue to build that bond, thinking of all five of our cities as being a unit. So thank you again. I hope that was enough. Ask me later if you have questions. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Suzanne Hoheimer. And now I think Normandy Park is the Benjamin Button of South King County. <laughs> yeah, but with a happier ending. I, I always fall asleep at the end of the movie, but I have a better, more optimism. That's right, that's right. And a Brad Pitt face, so. Uh, our next mayor, uh, Mohamed Igal from SeaTac, is a role model for so many people in our community. For us at Highline College, so many of our students look up to him. He is a father and a grandfather in the community. He serves in the human services field, working in HopeLink and other service agencies. When he got elected to the SeaTac City Council in 2021, and now as the mayor, as the first black mayor in SeaTac and first in Somali, there's so much pride in being the welcome Mohammed to the stage. So, welcome. Good evening. Uh, my name is Mohammed Iyal. I'm the mayor of city of SeaTac. It's so nice to be with you all tonight. All of those beautiful, dedicated people. I want to tell you my, my Uzbekistan. The moon is beautiful, but SeaTac is the center of the universe. <laughs> it's the center of the universe. You can't come, or you can't come from Taguila, you have to go through us. You want to pick up your nieces and nephews from the airport? We are here. <laughs> so yeah, it's glad to be here. Um, I want to thank the chamber. Only, only <laughs> Samantha can bring us together. The last time we were together, she brought us. And, and I love that. We love the chamber, really. I, I mean, we do a lot of good things with them, and, and we are very grateful for our, uh, for our partnership. I want to honor and respect you and thank all the mayors. So, ah, uh, that's me. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I'm Mohammed Egal. I'm the mayor of the city. I was elected 2021. I became the mayor 2024. Uh, uh, mayor, and, and, and Shilin asked me, you know, uh, how I became the mayor, and I told him, look, I took those council members to the bar, and they get drunk, and they figure out, and I take them to the, to the chamber, and I said, we have to elect a new mayor. And they say, you are the new mayor. <laughs> so thank you, Mayor Shilin. Um, well, there is a lot of things going on in the city of SeaTac. So, uh, second slide, please. Okay, there are, when I became the mayor, I called the city manager and the senior um, uh, directors, and I told them, look, I want to do something. It has to be a reason that I was elected and I became the mayor. So I want to do something. So I want to find out four or five things that we can do in 2024 and 2025. And one of those first was public safety. Government that's not providing and making people safe is not a good government. Number one job of local government is to make you safe in your home and your community. And second was actually affordable housing. CTAC has younger population, as you know it, um, working class. Um, a fair age of city of CTAG is 32. Actually, they work service industry. They work 16 hours to pay their hands. 16 hours. They drive Uber, they drive taxi, they work warehouses, they work hotels. So affordable housing was number uh, two, actually. We are building, actually, and working with Mercy Housing, and we are, 
we, that will open 30, 130 affordable, affordable housing with on-site support services. I love the support services. That social workers being with the community that can help them to overcome all of those uh, barriers. If it's job, if it is, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and health issue, it's all of the, so it has uh, support services. Uh, that is a 30 percent, 50% envelope, which means that it will be around like 701 apartment, you know, and it has actually, um, uh, they are working with the, with the um, ARC, King County, with people, uh, people with developmental, uh, developmental disability. We need to give place to live people with developmental disability. So I'm very grateful that uh, Mercy Housing uh, and the ARC work together to bring this development in the city of Sitak, which is actually located in the light rail. So they can get, have a job in, in, in Seattle or Linwood, jump the light rail and come back uh, without the rifle and the Seattle traffic. Next slide, please. Next one. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, this is another uh, 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 market heat um, and, and, uh, and, and abarmatis uh, that's coming to city of SeaTac. It's around, uh, when it completes, it will be 750 units. Uh, there will be some affordable housing, uh, that 80 percent, 50 percent, but it will be market rate. We're very glad to have that uh, workforce housing uh, in the city of SeaTac. Uh, next slide. Yes, that another, another issue, uh, issue that we, uh, achievement that I want to report to you is that one day we find out that we have 700 in, uh, asylee in our community. We didn't create this problem. It was created by Washington, D.C., but they are in our community. So we work, thank you, and, and Mayor and McLeod and, and the other mayors. Actually, we work with the service providers. We work with the state, and we transition it to their uh, and, and housing and, and, um, and employment, some of them. So we, we are the only city that get 750 because we know that the, the Office of Refugee and the funders, they look the bigger actually number of it, uh, 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 service providers, which has the board of directors and all of those, not the community-based organizations. So they left some of the um, a community-based organizations, and we will channel that 750 to those community-based organizations. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, we have completed... Okay, this was the... Yes, safe. And then a few weeks ago, we opened the... Um, for Avenue, we we open actually an, an safe street access to schools and uh, pedestrian in the in the um, uh, Terry for Avenue and and West Sixth Street. That's where actually parents can take to to ch their children to school and uh, uh, to school so they can be safe, especially in the winter and the fall time. Next slide. And, uh, we also did uh, open sidewalk uh, improvement in uh, River Ridge Elementary School, which is on the south end of the city, uh, uh, and in the border of the city of, of, of Kett. Next slide, please. That was the 34 Avenue, the one I was talking about. Next one, please. Okay, we hired first urban forester um, uh, uh, staff um, last month, and this is so we can actually, uh, we, and we opened a uh, farmer's market pilot program with African community housing development who are here today, yes, and this is actually, they will bring culturally relevant uh, bro uh, produce and food uh, in the city of SeaTac. You know, some of the, our neighbors, they don't have their own store, actually, or local stores. So this is, they are bringing, and they are working with YMCA. Yeah. Next slide, please. Okay, we have public safety, that's what I was talking about. We opened some station, uh, because our station was the 
City Hall. So uh, we opened it on 154 an International uh, uh, Boulevard uh, and, 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 and police uh, and storefront. Uh, in the broadest market, there's new development, big and, and development in that area. Uh, we have enro enrolled seven businesses, new launched business watch program. That is actually especially new uh, businesses in the community so they can succeed in their uh, business. Uh, we hired a mental health a professional that assists the college in forfeit behavioral and, 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 and situations. Officer um, Reddit was amazing and, 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 and officer, and I made her actually. Next one, please. We have achieved a lot. Uh, we are working on the comprehensive plan, and, and city, city will release, uh, release it first. One. Next one, they are showing me one minute, okay? <laughs> All right, yes, so SeaTag is the best place to live, to do businesses, and to actually visit. Please visit City of SeaTag. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, uh, Marigal. Uh, next, uh, we, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, and welcome Mayor Thomas McLeod from the city of Tequila. Um, we all know how um, Tequila is a great hub of shopping and uh, experiencing uh, experiences with diverse dining and thriving business communities. Um, but it's also the place where I had my first job at Sarku Japan um, back when I was in high school. Um, and it is such an honor and privilege to continue to serve the city of Tequila in this capacity. And so, any, um, anyhow, please welcome me in uh, joining, in having uh, Mayor McLeod join me on stage. As you celebrate uh, Sammy's success, remember she came from Tequila. <laughs> Uh, my name is Thomas McLeod. I am the mayor of the city of Tukwila since January 1 of this year. A first time mayor, I was eight years on the city council and six years on the planning commission. Um, and leading up to just this January, I had 30 years as a tax accountant. So I had to quit that job and become a mayor. So I'm not sure what I'm doing in three more years, but uh, onward we go. Uh, next slide. So we are facing some real budget challenges in Tukwila, like most or all of your cities, and how are we dealing with that? Um, because as it stands now, you know, our revenues, or well, I'll say our expenses grow at about, let's say 5%, and our revenues are capped at 1%. If you look at them on a chart, it probably looks like a a growth chart for Mohammed Gall and a growth chart for me. They are just opposite each other in how they go. Well, what we did, one of the things we did was that we, uh, facing these challenges, um, that the we put together a financial sustainability committee of stakeholders, residents, and uh, businesses to kind of tell us, amidst this reality, where do you want us to go as a city? And to have them partner with us. You know, back in 2013, 14, if you read the mayor's letter for our budget, they allocated six million for sidewalks. I can't do that in this budget that we have. And so we're facing some real infrastructure challenges. And how do we go about uh, dealing with that? So we put together a sustainability plan that they asked of us to be good stewards, if we weren't already, to be better stewards of the public resources, to invest in the community's highest priorities, and to invest in Tukwila's future. So that's kind of the plan we're doing going forward. Next slide. You know, so we're dealing with, we have a mall in our city, maybe you've heard of it, Westville South Center. You might be one of the 16 million people that attend that mall during the year. And so it's a robust area, but with it comes a lot of public safety challenges. And so one of the things that we're doing this year is we are investing in public safety with this budget, and we want to allocate two Tukwila police officers to be at the mall all the time. We think that will be a great message to the community. But we recognize that on our revenues that sales tax mitigation payments, they're ending. ARPA funds are ending. We've instituted a new B&O tax, but we're still trying to you know, understand how that's gonna serve the community. Grants are being reduced. Our expenses, labor and personnel, inflation, um, our own fleet reform program of our, um, in our city, and increased costs of just operations. 
all of it is impacting our budget. And so we're really working hard to put together a budget that promotes public safety, that makes the city affordable with housing uh, and for businesses to be there. Um, like I said, the new B&O tax is uh, it's just something new that we're trying that we never had before. Next slide. The public safety. And we've been able to actually reach out and recruit for our police department. And for the first time in many, many years, we are fully staffed in Tukwila Police. Um, including some kick-ass women that uh, are making a strong presence on, on the force. And we're happy to have them because they too represent our community. Um, if I can give you a quick update on Riverton Park United Methodist Church, which was the epicenter of the refugees and the asylum seekers, we are looking to get, I feel we have a, a reasonable handle on it, although it seems to change on us often, but we are working on displacing, or not displacing, but placing those um, members of our community that are there. This wasn't a responsibility we asked for, but since it's here in our city, we are leaning into it. And we're trying to treat those people with the same dignity and respect that we would want to be. Maybe sometime in all of our journey, we were strangers in a land. And so we're looking for a way to place these members into housing and not the temporary situation that they have right now at Riverton Park. A couple of projects. <laughs> I wanted to tell you about a couple of future developments. Next, there we go, thank you. That, uh, that we are working on. We think the urban center, the Westfield South Center area, is prime for more housing and a dense uh, housing. So, for instance, there's a Pros South Center project just uh, one minute or one block east of South Center Mall that's going to have three bedroom apartments, which will be great for families to live in that area. Uh, there's an area south of Claim Jumper restaurant down there on 180th. We see a lot of land down there, and we're working with a the developer there that would build out that area with more housing. So we think there is tremendous opportunity to build housing in that South Center core, and we hope we can do that and make it a space that's livable and affordable for people. And I want to also add Health Point. Up on TIB at about 144th across the street from the SARS, uh, behind the shag buildings, there's some vacant land there, and we are working with Health Point for a health clinic that will go there. It's on, on a bus route and will serve the community there, and we're hopeful we can add to that development something that would be in the form of um, community center type events for teens and seniors. Uh, so we're really excited about what's coming together there. Maybe we'll have more announcements later. I can't share some things tonight. Uh, but and one of the things, the Long Acre site, you know, those of you been around a while know where that's at, down just off the West Valley Highway, just across the Tukwila border, um, and that's where the Sounders are practicing now, and also Alaska Airlines is gonna be moving to that facility, but there's about 3,000 housing units that Unico is wanting to build. And while that might be just across the border in Tukwila, we believe it really adds to that whole area, that West Valley community there, and bring, you know, we'll support the business community that's around the South Center area and the South Center area. So we're excited about that. I want to tell you next slide about some of the innovative businesses that come to Tukwila. And we're very proud of them. The one you see here in this picture is Starfish. And they are a company developing a new type of satellite that can move, repair, and refuel satellites that are already in space. And I had a chance to tour their office and see the energy from all the young, talented people that are there. And they even go up and pull satellites that are dead out of orbit and bring them back to Earth. I thought, what a fascinating business. Um, another one, Leo Stella, is manufacturing small communication satellites that are in space now. And another one called Avalanche Energy. And their goal is to build the world's first and smallest nuclear fusion reactor. They're creating new technology and if they can pull it off, it'll transform the world. So these are exciting things that are going on in Tukwila. But perhaps most exciting, next slide, is the World Cup. <laughs> so if I look at this event like the, we're having a family wedding and we gotta get the property, the estate, already trimmed and primed because the family's coming over. And there's going to be about 750,000 tourists that come to the Puget Sound area. They're coming 
to all of our cities. From Vancouver to Vancouver, hotels will all be sold out. They estimate that uh, the viewership of this is going to be bigger than the Super Bowl and the Summer Olympics combined. So it's going to be huge for all of us, and I hope you're doing things to get your city ready. Um, there will be six matches that will be held at Lumen Field uh, in both June and July of 2026. It sounds a little ways away, but we're working on getting our parks ready and, and our streets. We're looking at uh, the trails that go along the river, and how can we showcase ourselves best to the world? So we invite you to do it with us. It's going to be a fun time, and the build-up to it will be great. So I look forward to it, and you should as well. My last slide. If you haven't already um, followed us on Experience Tuckwilla, we invite you to. Uh, we are a vibrant community that feeds all of your communities, and as well, you feed into ours. And so let's share this experience together. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor McLeod, and thank you to all of our mayors for taking the time to share a collective update of the state of our region. Your insights and invalu are invaluable to our community, and we appreciate your leadership and dedication. Thank you for being here tonight to meet our business community where they are and address the most top of mind pressing issues that are a priority for our business community. Thank you. And once again, a big thank you to our sponsors for your support of our chamber. And your partnership makes the, these events possible, and we couldn't do it without you. And of course, thank you to all of our attendees for being here tonight. Your presence, engagement, and willingness to connect are what makes our chamber and community thrive. We are stronger together, and through collaboration and shared commitment, as we've seen demonstrated all through the night, um, we will continue to be able to move our communities forward. As we close the formal pr program, I want to encourage you all to stay, connect, and keep the conversations going. The relationships we build here are at the heart of our work and are essential to driving positive change in our region. Remember that the Chamber is in business for your business. And thank you for joining us tonight and have a wonderful evening. Thank <laughs> you.